Let's go, baby. Welcome to the Athletes and Asses podcast. I'm your host, Noah Lack, and I bring on elite athletes to chat about a business topic, whether it's venture capital, retail, sales, crypto. Your favorite athletes know a lot more about business than you think, but how would you know that from just watching mainstream media? You're going to learn a topic of business here, but you're also going to learn a lot about the athletes themselves. Tune in. Please like, subscribe, give us a follow because we're bringing the heat. Let's get it. So if you're a basketball coach or trainer looking to connect with new clients, U Trade is here to help you manage your business and reach a wider audience. Best of all, it's completely free to use. Simply create a profile, list your services, post pins, and share your free booking website link. You can set your own rates and schedule, right? And like use U Train to communicate with clients, manage appointments, handle refunds, collect payments automatically. I mean, what? Why are you waiting? Join U Train today for free and start reaching new clients. It's U Train. U T R A I N. Download today in the App Store and Google Play. Let's get it. Let's go, babies! Another episode of the Athletes and Assets podcast. I'm your host, Noah Lack, and I'm joined by an absolute Michigan basketball legend, Nick Stauskas, Final Four appearance his freshman year, Big Ten Player of the Year his sophomore year, had a great NBA career, and is now freshly retired. And we got Nick fresh off of retirement, so I appreciate you joining the podcast. Nick, let's skip the small talk, though. Uh, Your wife participates in trademark IP law, Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm wondering if Sauce Castillo has a trademark by it. Have you trademarked Sauce Castillo, Nick? I have not. I have not. Only because I haven't really, I never really pursued any um, real business opportunities from it and never felt like it was something that I needed to take full advantage of. You know, at this point, it's more so just walking down the street. People call me, and especially here in Philly, at least, people call me Sauce, not Nick. So, um, you know, if it makes the people happy, I'm all for it. Man, I I would figure with the with the brains in your family that we would have actually legally protected Sauce and then and then created Sauce. I'm just thinking like a businessman. I don't know. You know, a funny story that I will tell you though that when I first got the nickname, do you remember the and one? basketball player hot sauce yeah of course one of my favorite guys yeah legend he was allegedly upset that my that i got the nickname sauce even though it wasn't a hot sauce it was sauce casino two different things he was upset that just the word sauce was being used with another basketball player so um that was a little bit of a thing, but again, I never was like pursuing any like serious business opportunities or be like, yeah, this is my name moving forward. You, I'll only be referred yeah. to as Las Castillo. So it kind of went away, but um, yeah, I ruffled some feathers there, I guess. Was w- Did Hot Sauce try to take legal action or was he just chirping you? He was, I think he was more chirping me. Like, I think he DM'd me and was like, there's only one like Hot Sauce and it's me maybe throwing some, <laughs> some other words in there too. And I was like, what the heck is going on here? Like, well, what I, other words? Though? I was like, I didn't give myself this nickname. It was a closed captioning error. I, I promise you it's none of my doing. So. Yeah, well, hey man, I, I like the nickname and Philly does. So we're, we're going to roll with that, man. Um, right. But shout out to Hot Sauce though. Well, yeah. well, and, uh, you know, love them on the pod. Um, anyways, Nick. You know, thanks again for joining. And I, this is really exciting because, I mean, you retired September officially 2022. Uh, you have done some broadcasting media stuff. And I definitely want to tap into your brain and and uh, chat about, you know, what it takes to, to sort of thrive in the, the broadcasting media industry for, for people who want to know. But before that, Nick, we got to talk a little bit about the stock market, man. man. You said that almost... All of your NBA game checks have been put into the stock market. Is this true? Correct. Yes, that and my house. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm very big into investments, and um, you know, I just feel like if it's done correctly with um, a long time horizon, that you know, your chances of of building real wealth are very high, and so. Um, you know, I think it was mainly during COVID, 
Um, when COVID hit, I was recovering from a knee surgery. Uh, I was playing overseas in Spain. I moved back home. And so for the first time almost in my whole life, um, wasn't on a team, didn't have practices, was just locked in the house. And at that time, I didn't have any money invested in the market. And what happened was my dad around March 12th or March 13th, he texted me and he, and I was against investing at this time. Cause I was, I didn't understand how it worked. And I was like, well, why am I risking all my money when it can just, things can fluctuate, things can go down exactly how it did when, when COVID happened, you know, the market took a big hit because there was a lot of fear out there in terms of what would happen in the world. And my dad texted me and he said, look, the, you know, the market, all these stocks, they've dropped 20, 30, 40, 50% in the past week with all these COVID fears. And he goes, there's never been a better time to at least start like sprinkling in some money. And because I can guarantee you like this COVID thing is not going to be forever, whether it's a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, I promise you like these stocks are going to go back up. And then he put me in touch with a financial advisor and kind of the rest was history. And so the timing of it was actually kind of crazy because the the first day that I started investing was the day that I believe the market had bottomed from the COVID fears. And so what mm. really sparked my interest was um, seeing the upward trajectory of like my personal holdings and then being like, wait a minute, I can make money doing nothing. And granted, it doesn't, you know, things don't always go up in a linear fashion, but um, that's what kind of like sparked my interest where I was like, man, I never realized, I always thought of, man, the only way I'm going to make money is by playing basketball, being involved with basketball. And so now all of a sudden there's this whole new world that became available to me. And, um, you know, I took a huge interest in it. And, my, you know, my wife makes fun of me every day. You know, I'm having my coffee in the morning and I'm already looking at pre-market stuff. I'm kind of reading articles, seeing what's going on. Um, and uh, it's funny because I never- Every morning? Every morning. And you all throughout Religiously the day, or-, or? All, all throughout the okay. day as well. I would say, you know, every 20, 30 minutes, you'll catch me on my CNBC app, just monitoring things. And I don't day trade at all, but I like to just, I like to just keep, you know, have a finger on the pulse in the, of what's in the going loop. on out yeah. there. So you're you're waking up with the markets. You're you're getting up early and, and checking it. Well, I'm waking up with the baby, and then I have <laughs> no choice but to be up when the markets are opening. So you know that's how it works. Are we crediting your baby to making you uh, a, a a really good stock investor? I would say you know before before the baby, I would say markets open at nine thirty. Before the baby, I I could definitely sleep in past nine thirty. So, you know, there's a certain level of awareness that I have now that I'm up at, you know, 6.30, 7 a.m. with the baby. Okay. Hey, there we go. We'll, we'll, we'll give them, uh, we'll give them the credit. Yeah. Um, Nick, this is awesome. I want to put you to the test though and see, do you know your tickers? I, I believe I know my tickers. I, you know. Okay. I, 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 I own a Let good amount of companies. So there's, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to pass the test, but I don't know. You might stump me here. All right, I've got. It. Can I give you a couple? Are we talking about you want me? You're going to give me the ticker, and then I'd name the company, or you want me to just list the stock price? Because I think I could. It's it's whatever you want. I, I, I it's what I, I want you to showcase as much as w what you know as possible. So if I, if I can give you the name of the company, and you're able to list the ticker and the stock price. I mean, mm. Sauce Castillo turns into Finance Castillo. So I like I, I'm trying to help you. Like like I think we should do it that. Can we do it that way or what way? Does that work? You, you anyway. I can try. I'll try to do the ticker. To be honest, I feel like I'm going to be better at listing the stock price than I will the action being correct on the ticker. But I'm I, I'm I'm okay. pretty confident that I could do both. We'll see. All right. So let me toss you a couple. I'll start easy. Well. I don't know what's easy or hard, but let me just start. Um, all right, Apple. I mean, A P P L is or A P correct? A P P L, and oh. I would say actually no. Sorry, sorry, incorrect. <laughs> incorrect. What's the A P? No, just A. Is it no? No, no, no. no that's 
No, 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 no. Okay. All right. I can so that's We're the thing. Off to a fire Ticker, start. I'm not gonna be as good at Ticker, not gonna be as good at, but I'll tell you the stock price. I mean, it's probably trading at around $190 right now a share. Yes, it's it's right now it's at 189.76. Pretty good. The ticker is AAPL on the NASDAQ, so close, but uh A-A-P-L. two A's, not two P's. I was think okay. I knew there was a double M there somewhere. All right, one one for two. Let's 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 move on. Here's another one, uh, pretty popular one. Mastercard. Ooh, see, this is one that I don't own. I'm going M S T. No, there's no way. I mean, and I to be honest, the the um the stock price. I'm gonna guess on this one around. 140 ish. I'm probably way off on that. Okay. So, uh, the ticker symbol is MA. Mm, um, and the stock, the stock price is 408.45 right now. So, it's like the scene, look, it's like the scene from Dumb and Dumber when he's checking the briefcase. Swimmy, swami, swim, 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 swim. Check the briefcase. Samsonite. I was way off. That's, that's one of <laughs> Hey, I, I I'm going to give you as much opportunity to to put the train back on the tracks. How about Netflix? Okay. Um the ticker. Is it N oh there's I know there's an, there's gotta be an X in there. Damn it. Net- there is there's an X. There's an X. N T F X? No, 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 no. Mm. See, I'm not good with the tickers. Stock price, though, I'm I'm gonna say it's around four forty, four fifty ish in that range. That I, I'll give you that one, four seventy seven. Ooh, Man, it's gone up a little yeah, bit. Fun fun yeah. fact: my brother actually, my brother works for Netflix. Okay, very cool. What does he do there? He's um he's involved with the user inter- interface. He's a computer engineer. Um, so you know, coding, all that different kind of stuff. He's worked there for like five or six years now. So. You would think I did. He go to Michigan. Weird. Say it again. Did he go to Michigan? No, he uh, went to school in Canada. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michigan is a big has a big comp sci scene. Did you ever consider doing comp sci computer science at, at Michigan or was my it dad just le- computer le- computer engineer my communications? <laughs> my dad's a computer engineer. My brother's computer engineer, and I was definitely not gonna follow in those footsteps. So it's unfortunate. Okay. All right. Look. Let's. I want to the, the end the trivia on a on a really positive note. Can you uh, give me a couple companies for me to ask you um, well, without? And I trust that you're not looking at anything. Yeah. So um, here's the thing. I, you would think I'd be better informed on those two. Mastercard, and Netflix are two that I don't have, but I would say I I own probably eighty different companies. Um, what What about Microsoft? I have Microsoft. Uh, I have a good amount of Microsoft. It's probably trading around three hundred and eighty, three hundred eighty-two dollars a share, and MSFT is the ticker. I want to say. Let's go, baby. We're back. We are back. If you give Both me, if, are correct. If you give me stocks that I have, but I mean, yeah, how are you going to know the stocks that I have? I, I mean, I in general, I don't know most of them, but I, I, I'm. You caught me slipping here. Microsoft is 380.78. I give you that. You're like a who cares? You're a dollar. That's really close. MSFT, pretty. Yep, that is the ticker. Um should I give you one more just to just to close just it for, off? Just just for some laughs. Why not? What about what about Uber? Okay. Uber is I just it's U B E R. I think it's just the spelling and the stock when I checked earlier today, I don't own Uber. I wanted to buy in early. I didn't. I think it's at fifty six dollars a share right now. Your most boom nailed it. There we go. Uber U uh, B E R ticker. Yep, it's the the name and then the the ticker symbol. Excuse me, and then uh, fifty eight point fifty eight dollars fifty six dollars twenty eight cents right now trading. But so you know, I showed that around. you know I have a pulse on it, but I'm not. <laughs> you do. I got some. I got some. No, no, no. no. We were not asking uh, for perfection, but at the same time, um, you're you're definitely not uh, in the Charles Barkley category of who we play for and, and get everywhere. You you know your stuff clearly, like <laughs> oh, <that> was, <laughs> clearly, like that was funny. 
Yeah. Um, so, w- like, what have you learned per- just investing in, in these different stocks? Like, how has it how has it fueled your financial brain? Like, and, and and have you been in you've been in the stock market since you were playing? Well, so I was in the stock market. My my parents basically helped um, helped me with my finances when I got drafted because I was 20 years old, and my rookie deal um, for being the eighth pick was four years, 12 million dollars. And I'm 20 years old. I don't know what to do with that. So my parents set me up with this financial advisor, and I started investing. And I think it was 2017, 2018 came around and I'm like, I'd have these meetings every like six months with my advisor and he would kind of break down, okay, this is, you know, this is up so-and-so, um, you know, this is down, blah, blah, blah. He'd go through everything. And I, at that point, just my mindset was just basketball, basketball, basketball. So I really didn't care. And to be honest, what turned me off was I started seeing how many of the stocks I owned were actually losing money. And so it came to a point where I was uh, nearing the end of my rookie deal. And I was like, dad, why am I like, why am I doing this? Like I'm risking all of my life's work in this market. And like some of the things are losing money. And then I, on top of that, I'm paying this guy to do it for me. And he's getting, he's making money, whether my stocks go off you because down or up, it doesn't matter. So I was like, I'm done with it. I'm taking all my money. I'm firing this guy. And he was like, all right, well, you can't just have all that money sitting there in a checking account. So he was like, let me get you set up. We'll put you in these like 90 day GICs that will at least, you know, pay you one, two, three percent. So you're, you know, so you're at least making something. And those are, you know, very, very safe. You're not going to lose any money on those. So I'm like, all right, fine. Um, And then, you know, from 2018 to 2020, that's kind of what I was doing. And then when COVID hit, as I explained, that opportunity presented itself and, um, Within that summer, um, you know, from the market bottoming, bottoming in March, you know, over the next six months, um, you know, I had about two or three million dollars of unrealized gains. Um, And so for me, that was eye opening where I was like, I have done nothing but just, you know, sit back and just put my money in these things. And it has grown that much. Like I made you know, a full year salary playing basketball by doing nothing. And so that was, that's kind of what made me get to the point where I'm like, man, I want to know more. I want to know everything. Like I want to, I want to follow this stuff. I want to know, you know, I want to know all the trends. I want to know why people are doing certain things. And so, you know, it's got to the point now where it's been three years um, of pretty much every day reading up on things, keeping track of things and, um, yeah, it's it's making so money. You, you you you've made two to three million dollars in the stock market while playing. I th- that was in my first six months of COVID that I now granted they were oh unrealized goodness. gain they were unrealized gains. So like basically the value of my holdings had gone up, you know, two or three million dollars in a short amount of time because. I just got lucky with the timing, you know, the stocks had all fallen so much because of the COVID fears. And then the world started realizing, okay, wait, you know, maybe we can still function with COVID, with COVID-19 and blah, blah, blah. And things rebounded. And I timed it in a way where, you know, the value of all those holdings had increased drastically. But at the same time, you know, once 2022 hit, you know, there was, um, you know, it was one of, it was one of the, I think five or six bear markets in, you know, in, and bear market is when the stocks, the, the averages go down 20% from their peaks. So again, you know, I might have a certain amount of unrealized gains, but once that drops back down, then everything decreases. And so there's these yeah. large fluctuations and it's, it's a, it's a kind of a mental game in terms of like, having faith in the companies you're invested in and understanding that over long periods of time, like I talked about time horizon, you know, understanding that if you're in the right companies that have, you know, the right leadership over a five, 10, 15, 20 year period, most of the time they're going to go up. So for me, the, the key ingredient is kind of not panicking. And when things go down be like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I got to sell, I got to get out the market. Like I very rarely, sell any of my positions unless 
things have gone up like an astronomical amount. Like Nvidia is one where you know sometimes it's it's smart to to realize gains when things have gone up a certain amount. So um, you know that's kind of my strategy and, and and game plan. And along with that, you know, collecting dividends and reinvesting them. That's kind of like the easiest way to build wealth over time. Yeah, is was there um, was there a guy in the league that you could sort of sit down in a locker room and compare, you know, portfolio to someone else who was also very interested in the stock market that you could compare notes with? I never, I never had anyone that I would really go. I I haven't really met too many people that are like super interested in like me. But when I was playing in Brooklyn in 2018. Spencer Dinwiddie was one of the first guys that was like all about crypto. He was all about Bitcoin. And I didn't really understand any of that at that time. Like I didn't really, in 2018, I didn't really have the interest in it that I do now. But I always, like Spencer was like big on Bitcoin. And again, this was yeah 2018 when Bitcoin hadn't really even come close to the levels it's been at within the last two years. So um spencer was a little bit ahead of his time with that and i'm sure if he did not sell any of his bitcoin he has made a good amount of money um over the last five to six years and now he co-founded galaxy creator monetization app using uh hedera which is uh a, 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 i think a, a ethereum layer a layer one layer two sort of crypt you know crypto payment processing you know, technology that I need to be way, you need to get way smarter in, but I think they, he's, he's raised a bit of money for it and is, is going all in on uh, using crypto to uh, not only believing in it, but using it for payments for, you know, the new age of the internet and creators. So Spencer's a very, very bright dude, very bright, great head on his shoulders. And, um, you know, I'm sure no matter what he decides to do full time after basketball, it is going to be successful. That's just the kind of guy that he is. So I'm happy for him. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. In 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 your portfolio, is there some crypto in it? Um, are we gonna get out of this winter, man? Like can you can you offer any insight or what you think is gonna happen with the with the world of Web3? Um I do so I don't own like direct Bitcoin, but um I do my investments through a brokerage in Canada. And in Canada, there is a crypto ETF that is available yeah. to me that kind of like, kind of whether it's Ethereum, Bitcoin, whatever, kind of keeps the prices of all those into one. And so I do own that. But again, it's a very, you know, for me, something like that, it's you got to be smart about it. And you're not going to put like half of your money into something that's that volatile and speculative so for me it's like you know the allocation is like one or two percent of you know my entire portfolio and that way you have some skin in the game and you can ride the wave but also if things bust and it goes to zero you're not gonna you know you're not your your finances and wealth aren't going to go down the toilet so um that's kind of my strategy with it but um Bitcoin was one of the ones where I actually, I, I bought a car in 2022 with strictly, uh, before the ETF, I had just strictly Bitcoin and I bought in at 30,000 and it went to 67,000. I sold and I turned those gains into a car. So I made it real and I kind of timed it, timed it perfectly on that. But, um, it's one of those ones where it could have very easily done the opposite and gone to, and, you know gone to 10,000 instead of 60. So um, it's just something that, you know, even for Here me- we go, baby. For me, crypto- hey, on the license, the license plate on that car is gonna say GM. Good morning. You know, <laughs> good morning. <laughs> oh man. No, yeah, it's, there we go. It's, it's I mean, it, it's great being able to make things real um, because until you sell, until you sell those holdings, it's just paper. It's just all imaginary stuff kind of so to be able to sometimes sell and turn it into a car or a house or whatever it may be, um, I feel like that's what makes it fun and like almost addicting in a way. Like it, yeah. I'm like addicted to it and I tell myself it's okay because I'm like, this is the right way to do it. But I'm like, it's pretty much like a casino, Wall Street and crypto and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, if you do it the right way, your chances are a little bit better than Vegas, but at the end of the day, it is it is somewhat gambling. So when you 
when you're so involved in the stock market, you really have to understand like what's going on in the world and how the world works and pick up on outside trends. For example, they say sometimes when when war happens, like economies start to there, there's more production um, in, in, in specific economies, and so you can assume like some stocks may may or may not go up. Um, I'm not. This is not financial advice to anyone, so I want to take that liability off of me and Nick for Nick's sake. Uh, but I, I'm wondering if there are outside, um, if there are, if there are outside circumstances or things in the news that you look for that might influence where you put your money next in the stock market. I mean, for me, I more so, I think, you know, little things like, for example, like I would say Tesla is probably like my biggest holding that I have. And for me, one, I believe in Elon Musk, um, you know, two, I think it is a good product, but more, most importantly, you see the ini the initiative from so many of these countries to, you know, basically stop the production of gas engine cars within the next five, 10, 15 years. And you, and like just with the initiative to stop global warming and to slow things down, it's like you see the world heading in a direction where the most obvious way for us to start as, you know, human race is to cut down on the gas emissions from the cars. And so what solves that problem? Electric cars. Who's the leader by a million miles within that uh, within that field? Tesla. So like th those are little things um, or even with, you know, Biden doing that, there's like you get tax credits. If you purchase, you know, a certain kind of electric vehicle, you get a seventy five hundred dollar tax credit. That's something that's going to get people thinking, man, maybe I got to go buy a Tesla. Maybe and maybe it's not yeah. a Tesla, but, you know. I think enough people are kind of headed in that direction where I'm like, man, I think that's a smart, that's a smart investment. Um, so just little things. You're, like you're, that. you're long on Elon. You're long on Elon and Tesla. You're, I'm long on Elon for sure. I'm long on Tesla. Very bullish. I think that is a big play moving forward. And again, that's a very speculative stock too. You know, the price ranges of many of the analysts range from, you know, the super bulls like Kathy Wood, who are like, man, Tesla's going to be two thousand dollars a share by, you know, twenty thirty, and then there's people that are like, it's it's maybe worth a hundred dollars a share. So it's like there's this wide range of like, who knows where it's going to end up? It's it's a lot of speculation, but that's one of the ones where I'm like, I'm willing to take a little bit of a risk and bet that Elon's going to succeed on that. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm with you there. Nick, what is uh you got a sleeper one for us? You got a sleeper stock pick that people should be paying attention to? Um, I have a couple. I I'm bit, so and, and do you do you mind do you mind when you explain this? Can you can you turn on your broadcasting hat and be like the Jay Billis of like of like picking a stock? I see. Does that ask you too much? I can I can maybe I can maybe do that. I for, there's a couple of things that I really like. Um. I think in general, kind of going off that play, um, I'm in I'm in some solar stocks that I think are right now um, the valuations are quite low, and there's been like some pretty big sell offs this year. So when things dip down, like um, Enphase Energy, Sunrun, um, you know, there's First Solar, Solar Edge, there's all these companies that um, because of high interest rates. Um, you know, these companies are viewed as, you know, they're not going to be able to grow as quickly because of how expensive it is to borrow money right now. And so again, with the, with the time horizon in mind, thinking that, you know, I'm going to put my money into something that will be worth more 10, 15, 20 years from now. I think these valuations for these companies right now are very attractive and, you know, some of them too, whether it be, you know, uh, Hand and Armstrong Sustainable Infrastructure. We have Enbridge. They offer very solid dividends um, that, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with while waiting out that 10, 15, 20 years, getting seven, eight, nine, 10%, um, you know, annually from these companies and then reinvesting that. And you can just see how that kind of grows over time. But 
again, these are things that you have to kind of keep a pulse on because, you know, things change and things change very quickly. And with some of these companies too, it's like, man, everything can be good. And then they, ha they report their quarterly earnings and their quarterly earnings, you know, just one part maybe missed the expectations. And the next day the stock's down 20, 30, 40% even, um, you know, that's how it works. And so then again, come kind of comes in the psychological part of like not panicking and, you know, is this company still good? Do you still believe in it? Does it have application long-term? If all those, if, right. if the answer is yes to all those, stick with it. If not, yeah. find something else. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's hype, man. We're long on the bullish on the, on the energy and the solar stocks. Uh, good to I'll know, man. I might, I might have to, I might have to hop into Robinhood and, and uh, take a, take a page out of your book this afternoon. For sure. For sure. Um, I, I recommend it. Yeah. Nick, if Juwan Howard invites you back to the Michigan locker room and then you go into the Brooklyn Nets locker room and the players ask you, hey, Nick, how do I get into stock trading? Where, where should I start to sort of put my NIL money or game check in the stock market? What would be the zero to one advice you give them? Like where should they start? If you're, I mean, for someone who's not looking to hire a financial advisor to manage their money, and if you don't have any experience or knowledge about it, um, you know, the easiest thing is to just invest in an index fund. And, you know, any of the, like for me, I like the Vanguard index funds. I feel like there's a lot of different ways, like you can get a, you know, all worlds fund. You can get, you know, just one that kind of mirrors the US markets. Um, but generally those ones are pretty safe. They pay, you know, a pretty good dividend. It'll probably be like anywhere between two to 4% annually. Um, and then again, it's like, you're gonna, you're not gonna get the volatility that you would get in a crypto or a Tesla or a more spec or even a solar stock that are more speculative. You're gonna get just slow and steady returns over a long period of time because, you know, the history is, history has shown that over 15 to 20 year spans, the market is, I think, almost always higher. So as long as you're willing right. to kind of like sit on that money for uh, for a long time and play the long game, um, it's it's a good way to do it. No doubt, man. No doubt. Thank you so much for uh, that advice and that game. And, and like really excited that you're excited about the stock market because I've been trying to get more into it. And so now, you know, we can compare notes when... Uh, you know, stuff happens. Um, that's like you said, that's a, a sort of a way to sit back and, and watch your watch your money multiply if you do it correctly and, and you get lucky and these things sort of come together. Um, but to fulfill your time, Nick, you started to get into the, the media game, broadcasting. Yeah. Can you speak about, you know, what life has been like for you on the ground uh, post-career? So I haven't done too much broadcasting Um you know, since I retired, like my baby. So I retired in September of 2022. So a little over a year ago. And then my daughter was born in September of 2022. And so the two kind of came together where I just felt it was time for me to focus on family. Um, and so this whole first year, I've kind of wanted to focus on figuring out like what being a dad looks like. Um, nice. And, you know, have that relationship with my daughter that I maybe wouldn't be able to have if I was on the road and playing every single night. So, um, you know, I would say that's kind of been where my focus is, but now I'm definitely kind of drip feeding back into the broadcasting game. Like I, um, you know, I'm based in Philly and I got some stuff in the works with the Sixers right now. Actually, after this yes, podcast, sir. I'm doing um, a little radio, uh, I'm heading into the radio studio for this show called Sixers in 60. We do it every Tuesday. Um, so I'm okay. starting to do some little things like that, but you know, my end goal is I, I you know, I want to be on TV. Um, and I have a good amount of experience doing that while I was playing, uh, my years in Philly, I was on the, the process teams where, you know, we weren't making the playoffs and I'm from Toronto. And so, um, back at home, we have this network TSN. It's like our ESPN yep. in, in Canada. Yeah. They would hire me as a player analyst. Um, and I would go back and cover the Raptors, um, playoff runs. So, you know, the moment our season, regular season was done, I'd fly back to Toronto. I'd literally stay at home with my parents, 
like I was like a kid again. And I would, you know, over the course of three years, probably did like 40 playoff games for the Raptors. Um, and it was kind of pre and post game analysis. Um, away games, we'd be in the studio. Home games, we'd be at the arena. Um, and I loved it. It was, I mean, I'm, I'm like, man, I'm going to be watching this game at home on the couch. So why not? You know why not go to the game gain, gain some experience um you know kind of start start this new career before i even have to start a new career that way the transition won't be as difficult once i'm done playing and uh, i owe a lot of i owe a lot to my parents because as much as i didn't want i you ever listen to your podcast or watch your podcast back and it just you don't want to hear yourself talk it just no one like, every other time <laughs> it's, it it's every other time man it's hard it's hard it it's hard to listen cringe. to your own voice and so when i started doing my work with tsn i would literally drive back from the studio it'd be late at night it'd be like 11 30 midnight and my mom would be up still up in the living room and she would have it, the dvr like she would record my in-studio hits and she would be like you're gonna sit down you're gonna watch what you just did at the studio. And I'd be like, mom, I, one, I don't want to watch it. Two, I definitely don't want to sit down and watch it with you and have you critique my work. Um, and she was <laughs> like, no, if you're going to be on TV and this is what you want to do, you know, you got to do it to the best of your abilities. The way you, uh, what was the quote we had the other day? The way you do anything. Uh, how, how you do, how you do anything is how you do everything. everything. And so she was like, if yeah. you're going to do this, why wouldn't you put the time and effort to do it well? So she started making me watch back my clips and then she would say, oh, do you see how much you're saying? Uh, do you see how much you're saying? Like, do you see how much you're saying this and oh, that? Oh, Nick, Nick, go ahead. Going on. Every, she kept going every on. time. No, go, go ahead. ahead go Sorry. ahead. No, go ahead because I'm about to go off on myself. Every time I hear the uh or I say like, I just want to like hit myself, bro. Like you said, I just said it. I just said it right there. You said it twice. Horrible habit. It it <laughs> it's it makes me when when my mom would point that out, I started realizing how much I would say certain things, and she started pointing out, well. If you are not sure of the next thing you want to say, just pause. Just there's nothing wrong with just taking a second to figure out what it is you want to say. instead of saying um like that doesn't sound professional or like like that doesn't sound professional. And so once she started sitting down, can't stand like she started sitting down with me and watching this, and I started becoming conscious of the things I was saying. And then for me, I started seeing an improvement. And just my overall, com just my comfort level um, going on air, it it changed. And so I owe her a lot because she took the time to really sit down with me and watch those things. And now I feel a little bit more comfortable, but I, I, I'm i not a professional by any sort. Like I'm just getting my career no, started. No, for sure. So uh, we'll see for sure. how it all goes. The ums, the uhs, and the likes, man, uh, that keeps me up. That's the one thing that keeps me up at night. The ums and the likes, you know? Yeah. And I'll say, I'll say this too. What, what, what makes a good broadcaster now versus what made a good broadcaster 20 years ago? I think that's very different or even, even I guess podcasts weren't really a thing back then, but people just, I would say 20 years ago, it was much more important that you sounded the part, you were professional, you Art, you could articulate what you could articulate a certain way and i feel like now it's more so about being entertaining and being well spoken but being well spoken isn't the number one thing anymore i feel like right because, i mean look again, at charles look at, barkley with all due respect again, look at the yeah i was gonna say look at the nba uh, uh on t on on tnt and no, no offense to Shaq and charles barkley but those guys aren't they're amazing they're amazing they're the most incredible team of on-air analysis yes any sport but it's not like those guys are just ultra professional and they can articulate <laughs> this like sometimes i don't even understand what someone's saying but i guarantee you i'm laughing by the end of it and i'm tuning in to watch them right and at the end of the day that's all that matters so 
I think that's that's kind of what's changed over the years. Whereas when you look back in the early 2000s and 90s, and you have like Marv Albert and and uh, Bob Costas or what or whatever his name is, it was more so like super clean cut and the voice and the sound and the, it, that's not so much as important anymore. I think, but you know, yeah, that's good insight. That's good insight. You you just painted a picture of the evolution of. Broad, the broadcasting profession, in which I've never heard it in that sort of light. So that's that's pretty cool that you've consciously thought about how we've gone from the clean cut Alan Iverson crossover <laughs> to like who he played for, and then it's you know what I mean. Just, yeah, just it's it's great how it, it, that's a fun change right there. I'm gonna le- I gotta ask you this question that I asked my previous guest. You ever did a broadcast or, or commentated, and the player did something? That you that you said in your mind and almost said out loud, that was so BS. He's not built like that, but you had to turn the filter on really fast. Well, here's the thing: I've never done in-game commentary, so all right, of my excuse me, sorry. So I and again, I think that is way more difficult. I think doing in-game, whether it's play-by-play or color commentary, I think it's so much harder because. Everything is reactionary. It's on the spot. Things are happening. You have to react. My work that I was doing pre and post game, I liked it because I had a couple minutes at least to prepare what it was I wanted to say and how I wanted to deliver that message. And so just those couple of minutes of maybe writing down some notes, I could eliminate things where I would maybe call someone out or slip up. Um, But again, the you. I'm going to tell you the toughest part of that job for me as a current player was being honest about guys that were just trash at the time. (laughs) You know, and this is, again, no disrespect to, um, to Kyle Lowry because I ended up, this was my fear. I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect someone and call someone out. And then next year I'm teammates with, that guy via trade or whatever the case may be. And the guy's like, he's like, ain't you the guy that called me thick on the broadcast? The guy's like, dude, you're an asshole. <laughs> Another tall white guy. Yeah, 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 that's the thing. It's like, dude, you're an asshole. You, you know, you said this and that about me. So I tried to give an honest opinion, but not call anyone out to the point where I'm going to offend. But finding that balance of being honest, giving honest analysis, but then also not hurting anyone's feelings uh, was tough to do. And Kyle Lowry in particular, Phenomenal player. He's had a phenomenal career, but he had a, a, a stretch in the playoffs every year where he was struggling, couldn't hit a shot. He was, he'd be like one for 20 from three. And then we'd go on the air after and I'd have to try to talk about other things other than how he couldn't shoot. Um, That's real. Yeah. And so but you got you to address it. That was the hard part for me. And I even see it now. Like there's been times where you know, Kendrick Perkins has, you know, he's made this kind of role for himself on first take and ESPN and whatnot. And there's been times where he's had to talk about Westbrook in a certain way. And that's someone who he has a close relationship with, but it comes to a certain point when you have to be honest about things. It's like, I saw one time Kendrick, before he started his statement about Westbrook, he apologized and had to say, I'm good friends with him. And I love you. I love your family. But I'm going to keep it real. You did some BS or whatever it was that he said. And it's it's hard being a former player that may have these relationships. You don't want to damage them. But at the same time, you don't want to go on air and lie and sugarcoat things and be like, oh, yeah, it's all fine. No, you got to tell, tell it like it is. Yeah, absolutely, man. Telling it like it is. But Nick Stauskas, that's a that's a that's a that's a good podcast name telling you like it is i'm sure someone's already stolen that but or, or have it but all if if it's not oh, we're we'll trademarking see. it we got some people yeah, we're trademarking that thing hey we we know some people mm-hmm. we do know some people man well nick thank you so much for joining the pod and chatting with this has another been this has been another great episode of the athletes and asses podcast with nba legend nick stauskis big 10 legend Nick, talking a little stocks and broadcasting. That's a hell of a combination, man. Thank you so much again for joining. We we touched on many assets and, you know, I felt <laughs> it was only right we did that. I appreciate you having me on. Um, anytime, man. Anytime. I'm always available. Oh.